ale for you or pitched a drink for the rest of us. Um, did you see differently before and after you implemented TASNA? And then also I see there's a 2.0. I want to hear more about that too. Yeah, so, I mean, the, the, perfect, the perfect example and test study was uh, doing more traditional orange blossom honey meads. Those are the only types of meads that were really stalling in fermentation for me, uh, both at home and at the meadery uh, with our first run. So I did two, I did a, a, did a five-gallon batch at home of an orange blossom traditional. It stalled around 9% uh, alcohol. Uh, first batch at the meadery, traditional orange blossom honey mead, one of the first, you know, one of the five meads we opened our doors with, uh, also stalled around 9% alcohol. And um, then all of a sudden I started applying, uh, you know, my initial Tazna regimen. Um, I had a cold crash it before it went over 14% alcohol. <laughs> it was just immediate night and day difference. And we're talking the same, same honey varietal from the same exact vendor, and every single time since then, I've never had an issue with it ever since I've been implementing Cosmo. Uh, so it's, it, it works. It's not a gimmick. It's not a fancy acronym for, for a new nutrient regimen. Tomato is the real deal. And if you, if you give it like the perfect dosage based upon volume and yeast nitrogen requirements, it's, it's a workhorse. And it works every single time. You know, whether you're doing a session mead or, you know, or a sack mead up to 18% alcohol, I mean, it, it works on everything. That's really amazing. I mean, so now you're seeing consistent, then you're seeing consistent turnaround times now that, that this yeah, has become yeah. your kind of, you know, fermentation method of choice. We're fermenting 14% alcohol in no longer than nine days. Dang. Hmm. If it's a if it's a mellow mel and we're fermenting the fruit with it, uh, it's 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 basically done fermenting before day seven, or by day seven, fourteen percent alcohol. That's impressive. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's serious stuff. It's it's, it's like it's a, it's still amazing. <laughs> Manny's telling us to somebody ask about yeasts, but Manny, that's your question. <laughs> That's right. Okay, fine. Oh, and real quick before we get off the before we get off the subject, though, one thing I've also noticed is there's 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 a um, I, I've seen or read you know a lot of people saying that oh okay well I like using a uh, fermato and fermate K uh, variation where you know they use fermato up front but for and fermate K at the end of, you know their last two you know one or two nutrient additions. To me, based upon the advantages that you get from Fermato, it makes it, it should be the complete opposite way around. If you're going to do that, I recommend mm -hmm. using Fermate K up front. Because Fermato, the advantage that Fermato has of organic nitrogen uh, during fermentation is that the yeast is able to metabolize the organic form of nitrogen towards the later part of fermentation. And it's not able to with inorganic form of nitrogen. So if you're going to do, a, you know, a hybrid of like a Fermate K slash Taza Fermate O regimen, use the Fermate O last. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, that, 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 the, the K in Fermate K, yeah, once, I guess, after the first few weeks or the first week, it really can't use it, you know, yeah. Yeah, once you get past, I think... Um, one third, I think it's about 10%, either 9 or 10% alcohol. Uh, right. The nutrients aren't even going to make a difference anymore. Um, yeah, but you're if you're using the organic form of nitrogen, the yeast will be able to metabolize that, that nitrogen towards the later part of fermentation. Right, and, and then you run the risk of actually feeding the bad ones. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, yeah, exactly. Then you're overfeeding, you know, yeah, then you're feeding uh, other spoilage organisms other than just your yeast. Yeah. Right. So my, so I always ask, uh, uh, everybody usually asks, you know, what's your favorite yeast? But um, I, I, I'm always interested to, to ask if anyone, <clears throat> if, you're, if you've uh, experimented with blending different st types of yeast uh, to, uh, to get a certain character or... Uh, um, I'm down with 71B for the most part, but uh, we use a total of four different yeasts at, uh, at Melovino, depending on the recipe. <laughs> um, sizers, for example, I, I only use D47 for sizers. 
71B definitely for most traditionals. Uh, sometimes they use D47 for traditional meats, depending on the actual recipe. Um, I also use CY3079, which is basically a barrel-aged Chardonnay yeast, which is awesome with the right honey. Um, I use different types of yeast, but uh, as far as mixing yeast cultures, I don't think most meaters really do that. Uh, it's, not, it's not really standard practice, I would say. And then you'd also have to basically you know, kind of uh, tailor your yeast strains that you're going to use. If you're going to mix more than one yeast strain, you're going to have to make sure that, both, you know, neither of them are uh, considered what they call a killer yeast that will right. basically kill whatever other natural yeast might be in the mix. Uh, so you'd have to either start with, uh, if you had them both up front, you'd have to make sure they're both non-killer yeast. Uh, or if you're going to do two, you could start with a non-killer yeast and, and then add the killer yeast as your second addition, maybe two or three days into fermentation, maybe. Um, I don't know. To be honest, at least commercially, to me, it doesn't really tickle my fancy at all to kind of experiment with. Uh, the only, the closest thing I'd get to that is um, now that I've kind of gotten into my sour meat experimentation. Mm. Um, so we have mm. a really cool story with the sour meat stuff is I had, you know, speaking of Frank Goldbeck at uh, Golden Coast, which every time I mention his name, I always have to feel like I have to say he is the coolest freaking guy to talk about mead with. Um, <laughs> if you're a germaphobe, yeah, we had him on the show. And he's if you're a germaphobe, you have to stay away because he gets very huggy as well. Yeah. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> but uh, but Frank Frank is like one of the guy. coolest guys. To, yeah, he's one of the coolest guys to talk mead with, and you know he. He hooked me up with um, a contact of his in California, that uh, a yeast lab that um, basically isolated uh, the specific strain of lactobacillus in a jun culture, you know, the other side of kombucha, for those who don't know what jun is, that prefers fermenting honey rather than raw sugar in kombucha. And um, so I got a strain of this lacto, uh, which has been dubbed the name Mead Souring Organism, MSO, uh, by... Uh, by the yeast guy, and um, so I experimented with it, and I said, I want to see what this lacto does on its own with no other yeast uh, in contention, no nutrient additions, no nothing. Uh, so I, I pitched it into a five-gallon batch of an orange blossom honey meat and uh, started around, uh, I think it was somewhere around 1080 or 1090 starting gravity, and I pitched the lacto. I even had a, uh, a, heat, a heat wrap on my carboy, and held it at 90 degrees. Um, wow. So the lacto, you know, that's the, the preferred temperature for most lacto strains, 90 to 105 or 110. I forgot what the, wow. the, the max range is of that temperature range. But uh, I, I kept it at 90, 90 degrees. <laughs> yeah, we've, yeah, we've just discovered what I can do here all year round. <laughs> well, <laughs> lacto is not going to get you most. <laughs> lacto is not going to get you much of anything, to be honest. So. You're not going to get any, really any alcohol out of a, a lactobacillus strain. But uh, what it did do is it dropped uh, the pH of that mead from 3.5, I think it was, starting pH, down to 2.8 pH in 36 mm. hours. Wow. So it, was, it tasted like you know, honey candy, basically, after oh. a day and a half, nice. two days in, uh, which was awesome. But uh, you know, gravity didn't change at all. Uh, I mean, very uh, just a very just a few single points uh, that it dropped, but um, nothing significant. Two weeks later, nothing else really changed as far as pH or gravity either. Uh, so I decided, you know, enough was enough. That's basically all I'm going to get out of that lactose strain. Let me take it off the heat, and um, I'll figure out what to do with this batch later. And uh, I went back to it about three or four weeks later, and I had a. Um, I made friends with a lot of brewers, uh, craft, you know, brewery owners here in the state of New Jersey, and I had uh, two of them come by one day, and I'm like, hey, you guys are going to taste like this cool, like, sour mead that I fermented with this lactose strain, and I pulled it out, and all of a sudden, it was a lot drier than I remembered, and, you know, when they left, I just, I pulled out my hydrometer and took a reading, and I'm like, holy crap, this thing fermented to 8% alcohol. Mm. Mind you, I added zero yeast to this batch and zero nutrients. And I was just dumbfounded. I'm like, I thought this guy said the slacko was not going to give me any alcohol. 
And um, so I called him up, and he explained, yeah, it's probably a wild yeast that was in the honey. And uh, I sent a slurry of it to White Labs, who who basically isolated everything, and uh, they found only two organisms, basically uh, the strain of lacto that I added and a non-saccharomyces yeast. Uh, in that slurry that uh, that I sent them, and um, yeah, they did a whole genetic identification, and yeah, sure enough, I found a I found a, a yeast, a wild yeast that ferments honey uh, to eight percent alcohol at least under two point eight pH, and I mean, and it started fermenting that eight percent alcohol at two point eight, uh, which was even more amazing, uh, especially when you consider there was zero nutrient to add it to it. And it's a and it's a super clean taste and aroma uh, that that it gave the meat as well. So it's just kind of like, like this crazy, like super super yeast that you know ferments clean, uh, ferments honey very cleanly at room temperature with zero nutrients, even in very acidic environments where most yeasts would have given you the middle finger at two point nine. You know? uh, <laughs> So I know you said yeah. that uh, you were working on this and that it was in for testing. Have you gotten anything back yeah. on that? Yes. So they they, they identified the wild yeast. Um, don't even ask me the name because I can't pronounce the damn thing. It's like two un, uh, unpronounceable words. Uh, but um, I have I have all the information. I'm still waiting for all the rest of the information, too, before I really start digging into it, uh, which I should be getting hopefully by the end of this week. Nice. But uh, they identified the, the, the wild yeast strain um, to 99% accuracy, uh, or confidence, rather, of exactly what strain it is. And um, I'm still waiting for all the other information, basically. But they're also in the process of they're banking the yeast for me so I can also order uh, pitchable amounts whenever I want from White Labs. So. Nice. So it's going to be pretty cool to start experimenting with it now under normal pH parameters with nutrients without nutrients different temperatures it's going to be uh, pretty interesting to see the outcome of what this yeast can really do under different circumstances do hmm. you know if white labs is gonna um offer this for sale to the rest of us or is this something that's still in the uh no it no right the- now no yeah right now it's it's 100 percent proprietary basically <laughs> uh until i figure out exactly what it is and what it can do um, but you know, then at a later point, that I could probably release it. It's a it's a yeast strain that is not co- uh, commercially available. Um, but uh, I have done research on it. It has been experimented with in the wine industry, um, and I know it is not able to ferment maltose. Uh, mm-hmm. I think White Labs even have to do something different with it because they normally actually ferment it with beer work uh, whenever they do um, test trials with. Um, uh, with different yeast samples, but um, yeah, it's really interesting. But it hasn't really. There's not much much study done on it in the wine world, even, and uh, nothing really conclusive other than it could be used in a way where um, it could be a yeast uh, that you could use basically to to avoid needing to do anything after fermentation, as far as adjusting pH or or working with different um, you know nutrient additions as well. Um, because it works in acidic environments and it'll work in under normal pH parameters as well with low nutrient requirement as well. In my case, zero nutrient uh, was added. Okay. David was saying, uh, David Webb, who asked earlier um, about the labeling, has said that uh, he did a sour yeast experiment, uh, just a two-liter batch, and used one of his sourdough cultures and some orange blossom. He said... It wasn't great, but it was drinkable, and it did ferment really slow. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. It's, it's a sourdough starter, yeah? Yeah. Well, it's kind of like, you know, when people ask me, uh, we get customers sometimes asking me, um, you know, oh, have you ever tried using bread yeast to ferment mead? You know, of course, in the back of my mind, I always think of John. Uh, mm-hmm. But my response to them is, would you use wine yeast to, to make bread? Uh, you know, it's sort of really, yeah, it'll work, but you're not going to really get great results. So have I. Yeah. <laughs> yeah? Uh, so yeah, yeah, the, the timing's left, the leftover right. leaves from from mead making yeah, make yeah. actually a very interesting bread. Yeah, I just, I find <laughs> that it's like my sourdough, the timing is not the same as you get when you just dump yeast from the store into it. 
you you really